special edition of the Keskast, uh, featuring two old Edwardians, myself, Sasha Wood, and Daniel Cooksey. We're going Hi. to be talking... <laughs> Hello. Uh, we're going to be talking about the role of family in Shakespeare's The Tempest. Yes. Yes. So, um, the, the main reason we can read family into the play, and the sort of... Um, pivot upon this particular reading is based is um, a particular line in scene uh, scene uh, act four scene one in which Prospero upon having consented to Ferdinand and Miranda's marriage um, states to Ferdinand I have given you here a third of mine own life or that for which I live now the, the use of the word third here is quite interesting because... We were trying to work out if Miranda is a third of his own life, what make up the other two thirds? Well, yes, the fact that Shakespeare specifically specified a third as opposed to, say, a half or a quarter means that there must be exactly two other components <laughs> to Prospero's life, presumably one of them being Prospero himself. Maybe. I <laughs> argue definitely, but we'll move on from that <laughs> point for now. Okay. Um, so, so what is the third third, as it were? The if if we have Prospero on the one hand and we have Miranda on the other, the, the self and the daughter of the self. What is the third constituent part? We were going with Ariel. Yes, yes, Ariel. Uh, um, his servant, his magic. Um, and certainly, yeah, in regards to servant, I mean, he has Caliban as a slave as well, but he's certainly fond of Ariel and respects Ariel, I guess. Conflating Maybe. Ariel into a, a family dynamic, as this quote seems to imply, is quite interesting in relation to that character on the basis that Ariel's gender is so ambiguous. Of course, Ariel has been played by male and female actors over the years mm. historically was played as a woman um through well originally were pro historically probably played as a woman um for mo until the early 20th century um i I'm think fairly certain that's changed. correct was played certainly played mainly by female actors in um the 17th, 18th okay. and 19th centuries ariel was ariel was originally played by a man is what i have but as written. female Online. Possibly. Oh, maybe that's a point. I'm fairly certain that there is some data that the actors who would have played Ariel in the productions on Shakespeare's were lifespan like were all children. Young boys, okay. Which, but then yeah. in, in the 18th and 19th centuries, Ariel was exclusively a female role. Yes. Commenting on, um, I guess, like Ariel's role of like subservience and things like that. Yes, I um, mean, it was a more conservative yeah. time. They had different attitudes. But, yeah. um, and then... The and beginning then of the twentieth century it changed. So this, it's interesting to fit Ariel into this dynamic, this um, familial dynamic, on the basis that we have a child and we have a father. So Ariel then becomes the mother. Okay, can you explain um, why it is you think that Ariel fulfills this role of the mother? Okay, so if we're establishing Ariel as the sort of the additional third of Prospero's life, with Prospero being the father and Miranda being the daughter, then Ariel and, in addition, Prospero's magic, the two are kind of conflated in this particular metaphor, mm -hmm. are um, fulfilling the role of the mother in that they, in a butlerian sense. Just a quick note in post-production to explain what butlerian means. Ah, uh, yes. Um, butlerian refers to the um, theory of um, Judith Butler, who argues that gender is performative, something that is distinct from biological sex. A, a, someone can be male, but perform the role of the female. So for Ariel to perform the role of the matriarch, the mother, in Prospero's family dynamic is not necessarily for Ariel to be female. Okay. In a butlerian sense, in that they 
um, are objects of affection. They're something that Prospero is fond of and something he treats as, as being gives more respect and agency to than his daughter, but he treats them as objects nonetheless, as possessions of his. Furthermore, um, when Prospero is seeking advice uh, on an emotional basis, such as he does towards the end of the play, um, it is Ariel that he turns to. Ariel's realm is the realm of the emotional, which at this time would have been associated with a female, whereas Prospero's is the realm of the political and the material which at the time would have been associated with the masculine. But then can the servant role not exist as a role in the family by itself? I, th I feel like servant <laughs> implies a slightly um, a, a more unequal power balance between Prospero and Ariel. Certainly it is true that um, Prospero has power over Ariel, which he does exercise, and of course Ariel is mm. effectively... Which would be um, the same... ...belongs to Prospero, but that would have been the same, for, the wives same for wives at the time. Yeah. And I, but a wife is more power, to, uh, has more power than a servant would do. And Whereas in this case, Ariel is given that extra power of the magic. So I would argue that Ariel kind of performs a dual role here. Yeah. In that, um, in this um, familial dynamic, um, if if one third is Prospero and another is Miranda, the final third is Ariel and the magic that he embodies, which is not exclusively Ariel's magic, but also Prospero's magic. Mm. And this means that by the end of the play, we're then given a very... It, the emotion of the conclusion is enhanced, because for Prospero to give up his own magic and to let go of Ariel is to let go of the final third um, of, his own life. of his own life. Now he is solely alone himself, his... His family is destitute, destroyed. Mm. Though he gains back his dukedom. So this thing, yeah, this, um, having given up a third of his own life, um, is the debate over whether this line is a sentimental line or if his life is something more uh, political and possessive in this case, kind of like... When he says a third of his own life, it's the things he owns and the things which give give him power, kind of like in a will, like the kind of things that he can give away. Yes, yes. Um, so Miranda is not just, you know, his daughter, somebody he loves, somebody he lives for. But it's also, in a sense, something that he owns because he gives her away to uh, Ferdinand. Um, and he does use Miranda for political gain, ultimately, because he does yeah. benefit from the marriage to Ferdinand in... in a, it would have, was extremely common, in, if not the norm, for um, noble marriages at that time to be used for some sort of political purpose. And mm. in essence, the marriage between Ferdinand and Miranda serves to, in the end, restore Prospero to his dukedom. And, yeah, and um, it being yeah, put him in the um, on, on gain, regain him the approval of the King of Naples. Alonso, yeah, so this sort of one of the two. This argument that um, the marriage being the you know the end point of the play the sort of you know the conclusion the point we're working towards is you know Prospero has um, orchestrated the whole play orchestrated the whole thing for this specific end point of political gain ultimately yes yeah and this certainly seems to be the terms in which Caliban regards this concept of the family as mm. evidenced by his attempted rape of Miranda, which is motivated, as he puts it, by a desire to... Um, yeah, it's not it's not a desire of necessarily love for yes, Miranda. Yes, it's or... to people this isle, yeah. I believe he says, with his own offspring, yeah. and thus regain control of it. The family for him as a means of reasserting the political control over the island, which he lost when Prospero arrived. And again, this goes back to that idea of... Um, absolute paternal authority in the tempest they completely dismiss any maternal authority i.e any um claim that caliban would have to the island um through sycorax having been his mother um that is completely dismissed um yes yeah and th that's interesting in regards to miranda as well who um of course is as i mentioned essentially used as a political tool by her father admittedly she does 
she seems to exercise proactively, but Prospero's mm. magic is very vague and mysterious to what extent she is truly acting independently and to what extent these are all instruments of her father's own manipulations are. Mm. It is very difficult to define. It's hard to draw that boundary. Um, yeah. But the, her yeah, because... status as a woman, again, going back to the idea of um, uh, Butler's concept of gender being distinct from biological identity, is um, that Miranda doesn't isn't doesn't really fulfil a conventional societal female identity prior to her meeting Ferdinand. Yeah. Well, in, I mean, it's that first meeting with Ferdinand, isn't it, where we really see that, we see how she is bold, um, you know, the carrying of the logs, especially in the 2016 RSC production. Um, you know, she's not fulfilling any of the typical female um you know, she's she's grown outside, qualities. grown up outside of society and without yes. a society, and also it's crucially about no with no female role models. Mm. She has no idea how women are supposed to behave, so yes. she has, in effect, no concept of gender as a mm. thing distinct from her own sexual identity. She yeah. knows that she is biologically female, but she has no concept of what it means to be socially female. Mm. Yes, and as such, she occupies a more sort of amorphous. Um, Gender ambiguous. Well, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, gender neutral. No, like um, like, um, like David Bowie. Um, <laughs> like androgynous. 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 A more androgynous. Like David role. Bowie. Um, yeah, and um, which we thought was interesting because Prospero on the island has tried to establish this hierarchy. Of yes. He is the master. Um, Ariel is his slave, and Caliban. Well, Ariel is his servant, and Caliban is his slave. Is slave. Yes, I think that's um, the distinction. Yes. So we thought it was interesting that Prospero, you know, that the fact that Miranda has essentially grown up in this sort of androgynous way, no concept of um, the gender role that she has to fulfil, it's interesting that Prospero hasn't tried to force that on her. Perhaps until he has, but, but until arrives. Um, only then does it become strictly necessary yeah. and convenient for him for which, political purposes. Yeah, which shows how uh, gender roles, particularly for women, are only created to serve, uh, well, the patriarchy, a hierarchy, a But I also think it's hierarchy. indicative of a wider transition in the role of this um, family unit of Prospero's from if not mostly sentimental then at least partially sentimental to almost entirely political mm. in um for, for, for prospero to essentially if he hasn't um attempted to force this particular conceit of womanhood onto miranda in the past mm. then for him to do so upon her meeting ferdinand is a, a, a politically calculated move to make her an acceptable spouse within the um, mm. social circle of which she and by extension he are about to re-enter mm. um, so that he can successfully reaccomplish his um, political, re reclaim mm. his political position. I guess that Prospero has sort of presented her this, um, I guess like a, a binary of um, how women should be, more like a moral binary because um, there are two other female characters who are never, you know, they never appear in the play that I talked about, be, that being Sycorax and Miranda's mother, you know, and we, um, Prospero refers to Miranda's mother as a piece of virtue. Yes. Um, whereas, you know, the, the Sycorax is called a witch and evil and things like that. Um, Both of them so... are described in very two-dimensional specific terms they're not really exactly. developed as characters in so much as they are placed into specific female stereotypes by by, by men, yeah um so yeah miranda grows up with no female um role models only having learned of these two sort of ends of the spectrum these two sort of stereotypes yes um, yeah and as such she falls somewhere in between until re returning to the um, returning to the conceit of this being a sort of transition from a at least partially emotional family dynamic to an entirely political one, yeah. this 
it then collapses and Miranda is forced into the female or or perhaps not forced into but adopts the female role for Prospero's political gain just as Ariel is abandoned um, mm. and left free because again it, it well, set free, yeah. set free she ceases to serve any purpose political purpose to Prospero the, mm. the, the game is over yeah and um yeah because he gives up his own magic and sets Ariel free almost in one yes which shows how they're linked and um but yeah I think it says a lot about the role of the family in the Tempest that you know there's this this crucial thing the catalyst is this action by uh Prospero's brother you know yes so it's all it's about family from the start but Prospero, in essence, has abandoned his biological family and created a new family of himself. He's found a new family for himself. Well, but it's always about hierarchy. I know you don't like that. I don't like the Tempest as a found family trope. It just doesn't... It's always about hierarchy. It's always about someone being at the top with all the power. Yes. Um, This is not an equal opportunity thing. Yeah, it's not family as something sentimental and equal and... And certainly um, there is still room for um, post-colonialist and even Marxist readings within this <laughs> um, within this schema, as mm. it were, um, in discussion of how those roles might relate to a sort of the the, glo- the global signifier of the family. Mm. Um, but I, I mean, it definitely um, reflects uh, the court, you know, at the time, I mean, even now. That, um, this is primarily you know, monarchic government, yes, it's, exactly. it's inherited, it's, it's familial. Family, you know, authority is intrinsically familial and vice versa. In authority, yeah. both political and also intellectual, you would, uh, and, mm. and spiritual as well. Um, with, so, so Prospero is conferred not just political authority, or, well, on the island at least, political authority on the island, and but also intellectual and spiritual authority. He becomes complete, every, his word is taken at face value, thus mis- al- mm. allowing him to control or use Miranda to his own benefit. And um, Yeah, language as authority, we, we yes. touched on that a little bit. Um, obviously that post-colonial reading, because they say that they taught, they taught Caliban how to speak, that he didn't have language before then. But we, an, yeah. all we know is that he didn't have their language. So they phrase it, they frame it as they're teaching him their language or are they just forcing their language upon him, you know, which is, you know, absolutely fits in with post-colonial readings. Um, the, is it, I think it's Act 1, Scene 1, the line, um, what care these roar is for the name of king? Indeed it is. Yeah, which reduces... In the face um, of nature, all of the political and social hierarchies that construct this society are abandoned. There is nothing. Yeah. The island essentially becomes um, a sort of void in which all of these factors are um, mm. abandoned, and all that's left is, or all, um, it, it's left to Prospero to make make sense of that chaos to mm. provide some form of governance, and in that governance yeah. is in a completely, um, it, it 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 it's it's suitable therefore that for to, to govern a completely wild and chaotic society without any of um, any any of civilization or society's society influences, and, yeah. he resorts to the most basic and fundamental mm. of all, um, and in, of magic. Uh, mm. Well, no, I mean the the family itself. Oh, it's like the, before there was government, there were small family mm. units, and that's what he uses. Mm. So, in the absence of government, in the absence of technology, in the absence yeah. of society, he resorts to humanity's most basic system of government, mm. which is conventional family hierarchy. Uh, but ultimately, he fails. Ultimately, he fails. Yes. Ultimately, um, nature, you know, is is the, you know, wins over these socially imposed hierarchies. But then, it, and only because he lets like it. Only because he leaves. But is that his choice? Because. I think he well, yes, it is because the end goal win. was always to return to society yeah. and regain his dukedom. Mm. So I feel that yes, he does make some sense of it. His, his at least temporarily, his his colonization of the island, as it were, is successful. Whether or not that leaves the island in a secure state is mm. another story. And the most several productions have suggested otherwise. Most notably, the nineteen seventy Mermaid Theatre production 
in which it was suggested that Ariel would take control of the island in mm-hmm. Prospero's absence, in a reflecting what often occurred historically in when the British Empire withdrew from its colonies and other empires of the early 20th century. Um, okay. Yes. I think we've discussed a lot now. I think that's good. I think we have. It's good. It's a bumper episode. So <laughs> bumper episode of yeah, it's a Christmas special, but, but, <laughs> but we've got it six months just early, a bit early, if not more. So lucky you. Lucky you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for this. You are welcome. <laughs> that's great. <laughs>